All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I see a, a, a good rush to, to get into the, this webinar. I'm really excited um, to have you join us today. Um, see a lot of people trickling in. As, as, as you get onto the call, please tell us uh, in the chat and you can select in the chat, you can select uh, all panelists and attendees. Just tell us your name and which organization you are joining us from. So as you come in, tell us your name um, and which organization, and perhaps even where you are um, uh, calling from if you're outside the confines of South Africa, That'll, that could be interesting. Um, if you are joining us to attend the Tech Savvy CFO Change the Game uh, webinar, then you're definitely at the right place. If this is not the right one, uh, stick around. You, you, know, you might learn a, a, a thing or two. Uh, but as you join us, please, um, I'll put um, the banner up here for you in a second. So you can see if you at, are at the right place. There we go. And as I, exactly. Thank you, Nontoveko. Um, thank you, Sia, as well, uh, for joining us. Um, we've got quite a few people uh, from Cooper, which is great to see a lot of support coming in. Um, tell us your name. Uh, which organization you're calling us from, and please select all panelists and attendees um, as you as you come in, so that everybody will be able to identify you. And uh, Georgina is here. Hi, Georgina. Good. We are we are we are we are getting uh, ready. We're setting ourselves up. My speakers are in the house. My guests are in the house. And today's webinar is Tech Savvy CFOs Change the Game and how to gear up virtual uh, uh, during uh, uh, a pandemic. How can you use technology to stay ahead of the game? Basically, that's the question. So welcome, Jimmy. Welcome, Rakesh, as well. Um, we'll give it a few more minutes um, as let other panelists uh, come in. But uh, as I said, uh, welcome. And uh, if you're just joining us, tell us your name and your organization. My name is Brian Chvere. I am the community manager at CFO South Africa. I'm excited to, to host you this webinar that's been brought to you by Cooper. Um, and I've got all my panelists ready to go and share some really exciting stuff for you uh, today. Okay. So as we uh, let a lot more people come in, as you come in, please remember, just tell us who you are, uh, identify yourself, tell us which organization you're coming from, and maybe some good information to, uh, to help us start off uh, today. So like I said, you know, if you're at the Tech Savvy CFO's uh, webinar, this is the right one, so uh, welcome. Um, I've got uh, my guests and I'll, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll introduce them in a short while. I mean, and I'll quote them actually, I'll quote one of them as I introduce my panel. One of them who is on this call says, technology should be part of our DNA. And um, I'm quoting Dumisani Lamini himself. He's the CFO of Sandparts, uh, is my guess. I like that quote because that's, you know, we're gonna take a deep dive into, you know, uh, whether that holds true or not, right? Dumisani, thank you very much. And also uh, I'm joined by, Asad Rajab, who's the group CIO at Implants. Uh, he's coming in from the tech side um, and he's gonna tell us a bit more about that relationship that the finance guys and the tech community uh, uh, play in, in the current environment. I'm also joined by Kirshen Pillay. Kirshen Pillay is a corporate services director from Distel. Um, and um, it, it's great to have Distel on here because they're also a user of the products that uh, Cooper provides. And, but to start, most importantly, uh, from Kirshen's view, he's here to look at things from, from both sides, right? Uh, I think he's very well versed in the finance side, but also very well experienced on, on the people management piece. So we wanna check if uh, Dumisani's quotation, uh, like I said, holds true. But anyway, like this uh, you know, wouldn't have this webinar if we didn't have Cooper. So I've got David Hamilton, who's the regional director at Cooper, who will then give us some insights on why do organizations coming to them? You know, why is technology important? So 
Having that said, um, um, I want us to kick off. I think we've got critical mass for us to start off our webinar this morning. Um, so to kick us off, I'm going to start with uh, uh, Kirshen. Kirshen, I think you'll be a great place for us to start and um, because just given how I, I did the introduction. Um, so as you unmute yourself, this is how I'd like, you know, you can set the, the structure for this discussion for us. What is a tech savvy CEO and, and or CFO rather? And why, why, why does that matter? And what kind of mindset should people have when they address this? Thanks, thanks, Brian. <clears throat> yeah, from my perspective, I think long gone are the days of uh, CFOs that believe technology and IT are support functions and cost centers only. I don't think that is the case anymore. However, that alone does not make a, a tech savvy CFO. Uh, uh, to me, what a tech savvy CFO is, is one that understands the technology and, and what um, that future holds for it but also understands the opportunity that technology brings and that by leveraging the technology appropriately uh, drives um, business strategy, growth opportunities, innovation at speed, while at the same time allowing businesses to drive down um, cost and improve uh, productivity. It's a mindset that's, that's required, um, I think going into the future much, much more. Um, but there are certain mindsets, uh, as you asked, you know, that need to be challenged in, in realizing this um, in, in business into the future. And I think a couple of those that I, I found, and um, you know, we've been we've been on a, a digital transformation journey as the Stell for the last few years, in in you know, um, with a much more focused and um, a lot more effort behind it. One of those was uh, our Cooper um, implementation as a choice we've made. And just to give you an idea, some of the mindsets required to really land this and leverage it for what it is, requires finance communities and finance executives to firstly move from a mindset of control when it comes to um, cost management and financial management to one of empowerment that allows the, the people across the organization to become more effective at what they do and delivering efficiency in other ways, whether it be data analytics, um, you know, truly ownership of, of areas, et cetera. So, so I've seen that in, in, in one of the movements we've seen through Cooper. The other is this movement from trying to replicate what we've done. Um, so as, especially in the finance community, you know, it's very regulated, it's very um, um, process oriented, but technology allows uh, us to achieve similar results by simplifying processes, reimagining the way we do things, um, and still delivering that same result. So trying to replicate the old way in, in a new technology does not work. And that's a very important uh, mindset to take into any digital transformation. And the third part, I think, is never underestimate the cultural shift required to truly unlock the opportunity that technology brings because technology alone will not give you the results you need and understanding the, the cultural shift required um, in this process is, is probably the most important element uh, of it all. Thanks, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, I think we've got a sound start. Uh, you mentioned something quite interesting. You're talking about these mindsets and, and I wanna bring in Assad here. Um, uh, Assad, you're coming in from from the IT side and they're really talking about the tech savvy CFOs and building on those mindset, what, what, what is the relationship that you have now as group CIO at implants um, versus the relationship that you had perhaps in the past with, with your CFO? How has that changed? Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, I think, yeah, just to echo, uh, you know, the, the previous comments, I think, I think there is definitely a mind, a mind shift change. I think, I think historically uh, uh, a lot of focus has been on, on cost and, and if I could use the words, keep the lights on, uh, so to say. So in other words, do the bare minimum just to keep things ticking over. Um, I think there's definitely been a, been a shift change in terms of investment uh, required specifically on the innovation side. Um, and I think uh, just to echo what Kirshen was talking about in terms of that level of control, um, it's really difficult to, to, to associate 
uh, clear business case benefits, for example, with uh, innovation investment. Um, I mean, the, the whole idea of innovation is for you to fail until you succeed. So, I mean, if you, if you think about it from that perspective, it's not like you can say, I'm going to spend 250,000 Rand and you will get 350,000 Rand in terms of benefit. It's not as clear cut as that. But coming back to your question in terms of the uh, of my relationship with the CFO, I think to be honest, I've been I've been blessed. So so Implats, uh, the, the CFO for Implats is 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 pretty much in the same mind shift uh, mind shift that the question is talking about. Very forward thinking, uh, especially in terms of uh, how IT and the business can can work a lot closer together to generate these these new opportunities. So I've been at Implats now for two years, and during that time, it's predominantly been discussions on uh, innovation, um, uh, our roadmap to achieve this type of innovation, um, and, and a lot less focused, I would say, in terms of cost containment. Um, it's more about you know, leveraging efficiencies and, and also investment in new types of technology. And being in the mining space, you know that 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 really does provide us with uh, with a lot of opportunities, because we can do stuff that's above ground. We can do stuff that's below ground. Um, so there's there's a large variety, I would think, of of opportunities or business cases that uh, that we can chase together. And I think the relationship with the CFO has been has been a very very good and, and rewarding one thus far, which is which is great. So she's very supportive in terms of why we need to look at these new age technologies um, and also very aware of the, the benefits we can derive from it. So, so I would say, I think, I think based on my previous experience, not just at, uh, at Implants, the previous discussions were, were predominantly around cost containment, but the, the new age discussions are definitely there, especially in terms of Implants um, and, and where can we leverage the value. Awesome, thanks. So, you know, what I'm hearing there is cost containment versus new age. You know, we are in the digital age, right? You know, and finance was highly governed. And I wanted to bring in uh, David here. And, and David, I think from, from, from your view, is there, is there like a deliberate uh, move by CFOs, you know, to become a bit more tech savvy given what, what you know, Asad and Kirshen have, uh, have said? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Brian. And morning, everybody. Yeah, I, th I think absolutely. I think um, what we've seen from from research um, is that really the role of the CFO is, is evolving quite rapidly and, and it's becoming uh, more and more strategic in, in organizations. And I think top of top of the agenda for a lot of CFOs um, is looking to uh, looking for ways to to streamline processes, uh, you know, gain control and visibility around their spend and, and manage uh, manage their risks in their environment. And I think uh, you know why this is quite topical today is really, really that you know during the COVID, I think it was made it more and more difficult for for companies to manage uh, and and really adapt to that new normal in terms of the way of working. Um, and in some ways, it's accelerated the thinking around technologies. How can we adapt and how can we make the business run, even though we've got these hybrid scenarios of of people working in the office, working from home, um, um, etc. Um, and I think a result of that, I think a lot of CFOs are turning to, to technology to help with these, these objectives. But I think when, when we speak about technology, I think there's a functional side of technology. But I think from a CFO's perspective, it's really about having the data points um, and the analytics uh, and the visibility in the business, um, you know, to manage these objectives. Um, you know, they, they need that information, that data points to to make decisions, uh, control their spend, uh, and manage risks, and I think, I think we see more and more risks, um, you know, popping up, uh, which the CFOs need to manage. If you, you know, compared to what we saw five, ten years ago, um, you know, they're looking at things like business performance risk and fraud and supplier risk, um, audit and compliance, obviously a big component in the finance space, um, enterprise risk and data security. You know, linking back to to a sudden and some of his challenges. And, and through COVID, um, you know, the supply chain risk and, and how to how just to manage the business. Um, so I think more and more risk is becoming a, a key component to what the CFO needs to juggle in his environment um, and, and manage on top of cost control and containment and driving those efficiencies. And the, the only way really to do that is having that visibility. And it's all around data points. It's all about what technology can bring uh, to you in terms of managing the business more effectively. Uh, and, and I think it's really pushing the CFOs to, to explore further and look at technologies to, to enable them to provide that visibility in their, in their environment to do their, do their work uh, successfully, really, Brian. 
All right, so, so basically you're saying that CFOs are turning to technology to achieve these great results or get information much quicker. And thankfully I've got a CFO in here and I'm gonna call him out Dumisani and this is gonna be for you, you've heard it. So CFOs, you guys are turning to technology. What tangible benefits are, are you seeing um, as a CFO who's turning, uh, who's tech savvy and turning to technology? Uh, thank you, Brian, and, and really uh, good good morning to our colleagues that are actually joining us on the on the webinar. Um, thank you for that question. I mean, the issue of really deriving benefit from technology is started many years ago before I even become a CFO. I mean, if I look back from the time when I was at SARS, uh, how we've actually used technology to improve the services that we actually we're providing at that particular point in time. We're very much clear when we embark on the modernization journey that what kind of benefit this will bring over the number of years. I mean, for example, we're transforming tax assessment from manual processing to automation. And this is how we give bed to e-filing. Now, if you just look at what we did there, I mean, we've actually converted from um, manual assessment, assessment of tax, uh, tax return from taking an average of three months to literally seconds on your e-filing. And this is how you then see your IT 34 uh, within second. And um, I mean, I know that nowadays you can even get your refund within 72 hours. This is what I talk about when you actually, because that's improved turnaround time. That actually makes the life of, of taxpayers much better and you know how to do your planning. I mean, um, uh, Another example which we had there is that we had almost more than 8 million taxpayers where we have actually to send tax returns. And I cannot tell you how much money, it's 100 millions of rand, which we have saved through printing, which we've saved through postage, and not to mention the lead time between SARS as well as posting those things to the taxpayers. But if you fast forward to National Art Council, which is my previous organization before I joined Sunpark. I mean, there were a number of automation projects that we've used, literally using technology to actually improve the businesses that we did. Apart from SCM finance, I, there's one particular project which I think I'm very much proud of, where we've actually turned the grant management system because that was our core business, from um, from manual to automation again. I mean, after the call for application for funding you used to see these literally boxes and boxes of application from, from, from artists, from art organization, and we'll then have the admin team start sweeping through it. And the interesting thing is that we receive this application in paper format, but because we have to process them in, in electronically, we have to start scanning them. And do you know how much time and how much storage it takes just to keep those files? And um, the, the system that we've we implemented is now electronic. I mean, the artists can, literally save the information electronically, do the attachment. And what is nice about it is that it really provides a nice audit trail of how is that application going. It's improved governance, it's improved transparency, and, and it, it improved the lives of artists because now they can actually get their funding much quicker than they used to. I and mean, you can fast forward to, to South African National Park where we are. There's a number of huge projects. I mean, the one that we've been busy with in the last number of years, it's really aggregation of number of system into one single system and one service provider, which have actually saved us much time in managing different service providers. It's also saved us cost because you're not only managing those service providers, but you pay them. But if you bring it under one umbrella, it provides a number of economies of scale. So really the technology is the way to go with every CFO out there. Thank you, Brian. So, uh, Jumisani, you know, I'm hearing a lot of things. As a CFO, you're asking for a lot from your 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 your, your technology team or your you know information team. So, I want to bring in Asad. Okay? Asad, and, and I was speaking to your CFO uh, some some time ago, and she had a similar thing. She wanted AI. She wanted bots. She wanted she wants underground Wi-Fi. You know, is she? You know, are your CFOs asking too much? Uh, what's going on here? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer, to be quite honest, because I think from a, from a CFO perspective, I, I also do uh, appreciate uh, the, the other side, you know, because we want things, we want it quickly, and we need it now because there's a, there's a genuine burning need in the environment. 
but on the other side, uh, from, a, from a purist perspective in terms of IT, they, there's a history, there's a roadmap, and, and you know, you've got to do foundational steps in order for you to be able to unlock the true value of these, of these new technologies. In some instances, like Dumasani mentioned, it, it, it makes you know, good business sense. You can accumulate uh, or aggregate into one umbrella and you, know, you can move things forward from that perspective. But if you start talking about the new age technologies like, um, choose one, uh, predictive analytics, um, in order for you to do predictive analytics, you need a big data store. In order for you to have a big data store, you need to accumulate all of your data sources across the entire landscape, which means you now need a solid integration architecture. And then supporting that, you need infrastructure. So when we start looking at it from an IT perspective, there's a lot of different layers that would require investment and would also require a, a, a good roadmap to make sure that one, the investment hits the layer, and then two, we can take the necessary steps before we can say, okay, we're ready to, to, to accumulate the data and we're ready to uh, start doing you know, different forms of analytics. In terms of, uh, like for example, bots, like where, where there were quick wins uh, from an implants perspective, we've already invested. So we already have bots in our environment and we kind of proved that the technology actually works and adds good value uh, from, a, from a transactional flow perspective. Um, and that will be scaled and, and we'll move forward. But I think the important thing here is I, I do understand the need and the drive for, for the technology, but uh, just on the other side, I would also like to just caution that before you can truly unlock the value, you need to make sure that the foundational elements are, are in place. You've done the, the right types of investment so that you can actually add that level of value. I mean, for example, it doesn't help saying, yes, I need a AI discipline, but AI and, and all of those new age types of technologies in terms of machine learning, et cetera. I mean, they, they, they data monsters, if I could describe them that way, you have to feed them with data. So, and the, that's the only time they're gonna truly give you benefit. And that means all transactions from all systems need to be fed into this one store in some way or form. Um, otherwise it's just never gonna unlock the value that you're looking for. So I think from my side, um, as much as from an IT perspective, we want to deliver for, for the CFO and, and we have uh, delivered for the CFO, but uh, the, the, there's also a, a pragmatic or realistic side that you, you can't just flick a switch and expect things to, to just run for you. You know, there's, there's foundational investments that definitely need to be made. And I think from my perspective, um, you know, our CFO, she's very aware of that. Um, and she understands that, you know, there is a roadmap, it is a journey. Um, you know, if you, you, you can't really say I want real time data when your database structures don't actually talk to each other. So it, it's those kinds of, 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 should I say, simple understandings that actually exist now on the other side. Previously, um, and, and I'll be open about this, like three, five years ago, when you start having these types of technical discussions with business representatives, um, typically they never really understood the IT challenges. But now I see that that understanding does exist on the other side, which is, which is really talking to the tech savvy CFO. Um, they now do understand that uh, in order to unlock true value from IT, um, one, they need the investment, but two, we also need to understand what the challenges are on the IT side. It's not like we can just say, you know, flick the switch and, and here's your money and everything just happens. I don't think uh, um, that they have that level of expectation. But to answer your question, yes, sometimes they are like kids in a candy store and they want everything and they want it now. But, but like I said, I, I can understand why, uh, because they want to get to, to that next level sooner rather than later because the world's changing. And I, think, and I think also from a COVID perspective and pandemic perspective, we've seen that. So the reliance on networking, et cetera, has become quite paramount um, in terms of, I think all industries, all companies, um, the, I mean, the, this, this webinar is a tribute to that, you know, the fact that all of us are getting together uh, from a remote perspective on a Zoom platform, having a webinar about the tech service CFOs, if you get what I mean. So, yeah. Does that answer well, I'm, glad, I'm, I'm glad I'm not going to be the one who's going to tell her what she cannot have. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm also glad that you've got a very good relationship going on there with your CFO. Uh, I'm going to call Kirshen because you, Asad, you, you mentioned some very, you know, critical points that I think Kirshen can give us some information. So you want to unlock true value is what Asad said, right? But we know that the transition or the agile transformation process 
is a difficult one. You know, you know what, what, what kind of things have you endured, especially during the pandemic when you were rolling out, um, you know, in order to unlock true value within a pandemic? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brian. I think, uh, yeah, just to echo, I, 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 I hear that, you know, there's, um, there's lots of challenges in, in, a, in a full digital transformation, especially when it comes to value. And understanding value unlock is one of the biggest topics um, around this. And maybe I, I just want to make one point before we talk about how we do that through a pandemic. Um, I think there's a, there's a challenge here that exists, and it's probably mostly understood in the technology space um, in, in history. You know, the, you've got this legacy architectures and a technical debt that needs to be addressed while building um, what is seen to be the true value of the technology, which is really that sweet spot of emerging technologies, AI, um, uh, um, et cetera, robotic process automation. But the dependency is so strong on your underlying infrastructure, et cetera, and your data. Data is also the other big challenge. And I guess the, the true ability to unlock this is the balance between working at that infrastructure and foundational elements while starting to explore the, the, the new age technology. And you start there maybe smaller than you do any investment in infrastructure. But trying to make that movement um, to me is, is very important um, because you cannot spend, you know, it's difficult for, for CFO to, to accept a two year journey on infrastructure uh, uh, refreshing without seeing any sort of uh, um, uh, tangible benefits, et cetera, associated with that. So that's, that's the one part. The other part is um, trying to understand the interdependent um, uh, value opportunity by doing the right cluster of initiatives and transformations across your organization. Um, the biggest challenge is trying to get through a single project or initiative, technology initiative, that's hard to drive specific direct uh, benefit that makes a business case work. Um, and, and it's important to understand that roadmap as, as Asad said, and, and how does the value unlock um, grow as you build the right integrated uh, um, uh, portfolio of transformation um, across the organization. And that's, that's important. And I think, um, obviously, you know, the pandemic has made a huge impact on, on every, every person, uh, let alone businesses. And um, I'm sure everyone on this, this call has seen those memes that, that ask the question, who was the biggest driver of your digital transformation? And it lists your CEO and CFO and CIO and then COVID. And I think most people tick COVID because it really was one of the biggest uh, pushes Towards, um, towards digital transformation. One of the first biggest challenges was how do you enable a, an entire workforce that have never thought of working from home as a possibility and remote working as a possibility to be able to do that in a short space of time. I think from the, from the, um, from the announcement at the initial lockdown, uh, Cyril made, we essentially had less than a week, I think it was in four days, we had to enable uh, a remote work for, um, I think it was over a thousand employees, um, including employees that sit at a, at a desk with a, with a desktop computer, not a laptop, uh, that, work, that live in environments where access to internet is a challenge, data is a challenge, cost of data is a challenge, and just your working environment becomes a challenge. So that's the first challenge you came up with in, in, uh, through the pandemic was just the enablement to, to be able to work. And at the same time, we learned that actually people are, people are able to adapt given the, the circumstances and the right support. And we've, and we've made that a significant movement. And actually for, from that point to now, we've been working predominantly remote, obviously, except for manufacturing and, and the distribution areas. And we also kicked off, uh, and, and David can, can, can speak to it, 
We kicked off our Coupa project in the midst of the lockdown, completely virtually. Um, all, our, all our design sessions, the entire project has run virtually from, um, from last year and, and we've effectively gone full live with all the modules we, we anticipated. So there is a way of learning um, um, how to work in a virtual world. On top of that, the, the opportunity starts to show itself, especially when it comes to value unlock and the opportunity to better engage with both your customer, consumer, and your employee in a digital world. Because what we actually learned is how do you apply what an individual um, experiences in their day-to-day -day, day life in, in the business context? So as an individual, I expect all my um, applications to be intuitive, easy to use and work first time and derive the value. At work, there's lots of complexities and there's lots of excuses why things don't run the way they, way they should. And I think this has forced businesses to also think differently about how we design for this and really simplify and, and focus on the com combined value opportunity of the portfolio of transformation required. And I think that's, that's been the biggest focus. There's still learnings to come as you go, as the world starts adjusting now. Um, I mean, a, a simple example is the enablement of virtual work and virtual collaboration actually transitioned quite easy, quite a lot easier than we anticipated. And the, and the world of virtual meetings like this became commonplace well accepted and understood. Now, as we need to deal with the social impact and the psychological impact of isolation and working from home, we're starting to see people return to the office. And what you've got to do now is you've got to adjust for a hybrid world where half of the people are in an office, half of the people are away from the office. What does this pandemic done to the psychology of our people? What are we doing when it comes to the trust equation around technology because that's going to be the future question to ask um, in all of our digital transformations is what does this do um, in terms of trust because that's going to determine the success or failure of, of a lot of what we're trying to achieve. I hope that answers that question in, in, in thorough detail but um, and, and I want to bring in I want to bring in the CFO here because uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that you said here so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring in Dumisani quickly for this piece and uh, Dumisani you know, there are a lot of priorities. There's a lot of requirements that you need to check. I mean, you've, you know, uh, Kesha was talking about the pandemic and how they adapted, right? But you're a CFO. How are you, how do you maintain a return on your investment, right? Once you get that gear, once you, you want to maintain that value, you want to continue to unlock value, but you also need to look at the numbers, right? How are you ensuring an ROI for your business? Thank you, Brian. I mean, um, the ROI is, a, is, is I, I think it's, an, it's a DNA of every CFO because you need to know how much is your money worth and uh, how soon you can get that money. Um, most of our project goes through uh, due diligence. Uh, so before we do anything, and um, we usually have this collaboration between the finance and the IT team where we work through all our projects, but before we get there, on a regular basis, we do an assessment of our IT infrastructure networks and our IT environment, which then inform us what are the gaps do we have within our organization and how does those gaps then prevent us to really achieve our objective within the organization. Then from there, we then start formulating an IT strategy, which usually lasts for the next three years. And in that strategy, we then start <clears throat> unpacking the kind of projects that are quite priority. So we've got a number of projects, but there's one which will prioritize and then we'll allocate resources to them and then we'll agree that we'll implement. And the basis of actually determining is that the number of factors that, I mean, you've heard about uh, IRR, you've heard about net present value. And I think what is more important is a payback period. And I mean, you've heard what the colleagues are saying that most of the CFO, they want results and they want results now. 
but sometimes not necessarily because you understand that depending on the nature of the investment that you need to make into your IT environment, some of the investment may take a little bit while. But as long as that little bit while is measured in terms of milestone and you understand when those benefits are going to start flowing into the organization, because what you're tracking as a CEO is that the money that has been invested by the business into a technology, it does derive the benefit that were originally intended before that particular technology was deployed into the environment. So that's very critical for us. So what we then do have, we have, and I remember this particular time when we joined Sun Park, and we're at that particular time, we're dealing with an IT uh, um, a strategy, and we had to present it to the audit and risk committee. And there was a specialist in that committee who really understand the IT world. And, and we had to crunch the numbers, we had to demonstrate how, how that will impact different areas that we wanted it to impact before it get tabled at the board. The long and short of it is that the projects that are undertaken, then we have a reporting mechanism where we indicate where we are, what challenges are we facing, what do we need to adjust in order. And sometimes what is interesting about IT is that you can actually do all your studies and immediately want to start um, implementing the project along the way, then you discover new information. And that new information, you then adjust your plan so that you make sure that you cover everything. And in some instances, it might even mean that you need to incur additional costs, but those costs are quite necessary in achieving the common goal that you actually anticipated. So then we use uh, as part of reporting, monitoring and evaluation to make sure that the, the, the project really yields the results that we in, intended. And so far it's been working very well. Interesting enough is that as we deploy a number of projects in our environment, then it gives rise to certain things because the better we understand our environment, the more we're able to implement other things. And we've, we've been very fortunate that I think most of our projects have paid off to the extent that we're willing as an organization to have even other conservation organization around the continent so that they can learn from what we're doing. We're not the first and we're not saying we're there yet, but I think every single day it opens our eyes to be better organization and be able to service our, 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 our customers and our guests. And the interesting is that some of our guests, they start experiencing the fruit of what we've been deploying in our technology environment. Thank you. Great, uh, uh, thanks for that, uh, David. Uh, uh, I wanna bring in David, sorry. Uh, thanks, Dunisani. Uh, David, and, and this also echoes a point uh, one of our guests on Tombeko has just also kind of mentioned uh, on the chat. Um, you know, how can, how do businesses, I mean, there's a lot of issues, there's a lot of things that they wanna fix and wanna get right, wanna get information out, right? But there's also a myriad of tech options out there, right? It's, we're littered with, uh, with options. Uh, from from your end, you know, how how do they how do you help them make a decision on who to go for? Yeah, thanks, Brian. And yeah, it, it is a confusing world out there. I think um, also with the advent of of, of cloud technologies um, and access to lots of different solutions, it's very difficult to kind of understand you know how to implement those um, you know and how to actually make decisions around um, that that technology journey that Assad was talking about and that roadmap of of implementation to really give you the best uh, value um, you know, and return on investment with any technology that you're implementing. And I think that's coming to, to play more and more around that return on investment. I think you've gone on the days where you implemented technology for the sake of implementing technology. If it's not giving that return on investment, then it gets put on the back burner and, and deprioritized as a project. And I guess from our point for you, there's, there's uh, you know, obviously we're more focused in the business spend management space, but there's a couple of things that we, we like to work through with, um, with our prospects when, we, when we're engaging with them and have conversations. Um, I think one of the first things from a functional perspective is, is really understanding your pain points. Uh, where are you today? What are you trying to solve um, in terms of the challenges you have in your businesses at the moment? Um, and I think it's further than that. I think it's really understanding what does success look like? So if you look two years down the line, what does success look like for your organization? Does this technology enable you uh, to be successful in terms of the KPIs, the efficiencies and effectiveness that you're trying to drive within your organization? And you know, if you're going through a process with, with technology vendors, test them, uh, use case studies in your environment that talk to your environment um, you know, that you can work through with that technology provider to, to really understand whether it is gonna be a good fit for your organization or not. 
I think the one aspect we always come back to is around business value. And I think it's been mentioned a, a few times now. Um, it's really about understanding that success criteria and what measurable business benefits are you going to get from any solution you put into place. Again, it's very easy to put technology in, but if you can't measure and manage the value that's coming through, how do you know that you've got return on investment? How do you know you're actually getting your best value for any technology you put in today? And, and again, it's something you need to test with, the, with the, your software providers. How are you going to show that? How are you going to come two years down the line and say, yes, we've added value to your business today? So it's another important uh, checkpoint to, uh, to look through. I think uh, Kirshen mentioned it earlier, but one of the other things as well is, is, is ease of use and adoption. Um, you know, a lot of technologies today, you've got to make sure that it's easy to use, especially with people working from home, different situations, office versus home versus other places. Um, it's got to be intuitive. Um, you know, you can't spend you know, a considerable amount of time training individuals, getting them up to speed. Um, you know, as we go into Amazon and take a lot and various other technologies today, it should be intuitive. We're technology aware and astute, so we should have that intuitive aspect to the, to the, the technology. The important element that actually brings is, is, is that adoption is actually driving that further value. So what we see in our environment, for example, is if you can get that adoption from your end users and your suppliers, and more and more people are using the platform, the more and more you have the visibility control of all your spend in your environment. So as soon as you start doing that, you start to deliver more value. So the whole value components and, and the, the essence of putting in technology in is really driven by you know, at the end of the day, people using it and end users wanting to use it, suppliers wanting to use it, because that's really where you get the best benefit from any technology. Um, and I think the other thing to really um, consider as well in part of your due diligence is around customer references. You know, don't take the word from software providers and have them show you a good demonstration. Go out to customers that are using the solution today. Go and have a conversation. You know, go and have a conversation with Kirshen, for instance, around you know, Ryan Coop and, and ask him what, what works well, what doesn't work well, um, are we seeing the value, um, and really get it from the customer perspective as to whether that technology is working for them in their environment or not. Because one thing, just having a demonstration and showing fancy slides, is another getting customer experience and output to say, yes, it does work or it doesn't work. So, you know, we see that as a key criteria for decision making as well, you know, which we, which we advise. Uh, our prospects to, to really look into with a lot of detail. Um, and then the last thing is just really around a, a long-term partner. There's two elements to this. Often with, with solutions, you can start small and scale within your organization. And that might be you wanting to start small in terms of your regional distribution and then scale, scale globally, what the case may be. Or it could be from a functional perspective. Uh, in our case, start with you know, procure to pay and then scale into risk management and sourcing and other components to it. But I think the key thing you're looking for is one, uh, is this partner you're going to engage with able to provide that scalability in whatever form or shape that might be? And also importantly, do you want to work with this vendor? Or do they have the right culture uh, and engagement in the organization that you're going to see them as a long-term partner? Remember, you, you might be in this for five, 10 years, whatever the case may be, in terms of your know, business and driving that value. You know, this is like a bit of a marriage. You're in, you're in this as a, as a, as a partnership to, to, to work with that, uh, that company and that individual. Do they have the right culture? Do they have the right values in the organization that aligns with your values and culture that you, you are know, able to work with them uh, along the term? So, I guess those are some of the, some of the things. So understand your pain points, um, understand the business value, uh, understand the ease of use and adoption across the, the solutions, look at customer references and, and get a feel of this is a partner you want to work with. Um, are probably some of the key things, uh, Brian, that we can advise with, uh, with some of our prospects. Thanks, David. And, and I hope, uh, Nuntum Veko, you're, you're on the call. And I think that speaks nicely to the, to the question that you put on the, on the chat there. And, and saying that, I also at this point, this juncture, I wanna, wanna open it up to, to the audience. If there's any questions that you, you, you would wanna ask, please uh, select all panelists and attendees, post your question in there to the panelists and we can try and address uh, that question. So while you think about your question or start prepping up in your questions, I wanna go back uh, to Assad quickly uh, and, and, and speak about um, this relationship a bit more that I wanted to delve into. Um, so who makes the, you know, who decides what, what, what tech transformation is required? You know, we, we're talking about a tech savvy CEO, uh, CFO here, 
but yet we've got the CIO also in the room. How, how, how that, how's that decision eventually made on what, 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 what's needed? Yeah, so thanks, Brian. So I think from, a, and I would assume that this probably exists a lot uh, across most organizations, but there's typical governance structures um, uh, that exist in order to, to channel these types of decisions uh, from a decisioning uh, perspective. But in terms of implants specifically, uh, like I said, you know, there's a very good relationship between the CFO and, and the CIO. Um, and, and both from a, from a formalized uh, council perspective, monthly meetings, et cetera, where we get an opportunity to, to share at the detail level, um, but also through informal sessions as well. Um, so between myself and, and, and the CFO, we would decide whether certain ideas, opportunities, et cetera, actually do merit investment and, 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 uh, and chasing it through to the end. Um, and once that's there, then then pretty much it's about, you know, kind of putting the meat around the bones, if you know what I mean, creating the business case to support the the, the outcome. And then that gets presented at, uh, at exco level, uh, depending on value, um, and, and then the decisions are made. So I would say predominantly, um, it's, it, it's pre predominantly at, at my level and her level in terms of us coming together to say, this is what makes the most amount of sense at this point in time. Um, and then if it's beyond a certain value, then, you know, due to governance structures, we, we have to take that further upwards into, into Exco for final approval. All right, thank you. So uh, democracy basically, it sounds like what you're saying. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, still works, right? <laughs> uh, there's a question out here, I think for, for Dumisani, um, how far has Sampat's moved towards a fully uh, driven accounting system um, is, is the question. And I've summarized it a bit. That's for to me, Sunny. That's your question for Sun Park. Okay, thank you for for for, for the question. Um, it, it, it's it's really advanced. Um, we we pretty much do everything um, on on a, on a, on 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 ERP. Um, going to those days where you used to have that big ledger that have debits and credits. Now we've got technology that really does the accounting entries for you. And uh, even if there's a new accounting standard that's coming through, um, it's able to adapt. And I mean, some of the reporting system that even if uh, you actually load all the updates on Grab standard. So which basically does that as soon as you, put, you process your transaction into your normal accounting system, and then you post them to your, to your trial balance, it then does all, it posts all those amount into the necessary account that they should be there. Obviously there's a level of review that is required by senior financial officials. Uh, one of the things that we've actually de 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 um, uh, continuously established within our environment is how to maximize the system that we're using. I mean, we just conducted a study which really indicates that there are even more benefits that we thought this is the current accounting system that we are using, uh, that it has. And we're busy implementing those. And uh, obviously it, it's a matter of getting additional licenses. And I can tell you that because it's gonna bring more people to be able to transact within the system, it's gonna eliminate an, um, a lot of paperwork. So I think the, the, the future arc of accounting is really in the technology because it has become a way of doing things. I mean, if I may indicate, you've got system now that, in fact, the current system that we have, it can even integrate with the central supplier database of National Treasure and be able to tell us which service providers have been uploaded by National Treasure and it bring it into our environment. We're able to upload bank statement. We're able to actually uh, integrate certain invoices, which make it much easier I mean, if you receive an, an invoice from an email from a service provider, it's a become of taking that information into the relevant system and upload it. And from there, you start really doing minor changes to get the information into relevant field. And I, I find that continuously, it helps us to manage our environment better. I mean, one of the things that we've done recently is to actually categorize between the two different service providers. One, we have actually made a payment um, terms of saying, the EMEs and QSEs, we're gonna pay them within 15 days and all other big companies then will pay them within 30 days. And I can tell you that particular 
um, uh, improvement. It has helped to bring more cash flow much quicker for struggling M uh, SMMEs. So those are the things that you can actually get out of the uh, the, the accounting driven system that, that we're currently using as an organization. Thank you. Uh, a question, and if I if I listen to what Dumisani is saying, and then uh, the question that you know that was asked here, there's a case of, and it perhaps speaks to the point uh, that you mentioned earlier um, about this mindset and this cultural change, right? Because this could potentially be been an isolated incident, and you're talking us, how do we move people efficiently from you know, you know a lot of this spreadsheets can be a habit, right? But yet you've got a system that you want to use, you know. Just tell us quickly, you know, what are your quick, uh, quick tips there? Yeah, I, you're right, Brian. I think Excel is uh, an accountant's uh, best friend. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think the, the change required here is, is to really understand what the offering of the technology is. You know, um, we, we've done this before and many companies would have implement new technologies into a business or an, an operation. And you still have um, behaviors that occur in the business that circumvent the new process, the, the technology, manual process, et cetera. I, I'll give you a perfect example for this. Um, when we when we implementing uh, Cooper, um, there's still an opportunity for the or previously we've done Cooper is now um, the technology for source to pay we've utilized. Previously, we've tried different uh, smaller technologies um, to manage our procure to pay, and they didn't work. And the reason it didn't work was they didn't think about the implication to an individual and the behavioral shifts required for the individual to utilize the new technology. And a part of that goes back to the point I said earlier. There has to be trust in what you imp implement. And likewise, when it comes to the ability for finance as a community, and I'm not talking just your, your CFO and your, and your senior finance, your broader finance co community that exists in the organization, to trust the technology put in place, to leverage it and utilize it in a way that makes sense. Um, we've recently done new... Um, management reporting uh, uh, installation in our, in our business um, with the BIP. And the resistance to the change from how reporting was done in the past to that is very strong at the start. At the concept of it gets people uneasy. And again, it comes down to, uh, and, and what you see at the start is people spend a lot of time reconciling what the new technology brings with what they used to do. And, and it, it really, you really need to be able to build trust in the way you land new technologies. And you need to take into account the behaviors and the people and how they feel about it. Unfortunately, that is a big impact. How they feel about what you're doing um, and they must feel part of that process as well. As soon as people feel that it's been done to them, you will have complete resistance. And um, and we lose that opportunity to land a real change. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for those insights. Um, um, there's a question up here. I think it's directly directed at David. Um, um, and the question reads: uh, uh, Does Cooper include uh, triple BE reporting, and what separates the tool from other procurement tools uh, or platforms? Okay. Good. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the question and the good question. So first of all, yes, we do. Um, we do cover triple V, um, obviously important element within our, our local South African environment. Um, you know, as part of our onboarding process with uh, with suppliers, we can capture that, we can capture the certificates, so we can flag renewal, renewal of certificates and things like that to help you manage that V reporting more effectively. And then that's obviously pushed into the analytics and reporting that we can do around the triple V. So yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, yeah, more than that, in our catalog environment, we can also identify, for example, preferred vendors, preferred suppliers to help you drive the, the guided buying process of, of end users towards, um, you know, helping out with sustainability practices and, and the SME support and things like that. So very much a feature function that we, that we you know, we, 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 um, uh, we work within, within the South African environment. So 
on, on the second question, uh, yeah, good, good question. I think, I think first and foremost for us, what differentiates us? Um, I think we're, we're value driven. Um, you know, we, we, we lead by value. We have um, sort of measurable uh, business uh, benefits and KPIs. We track about 45 KPIs real time in the Cooper environment. So again, you know, across efficiencies, effectiveness, whatever, you, whatever you're trying to track and it comes back to the success metrics we talked about earlier. Um, you know, it's all about making you successful. Um, in fact, our CEO often jokes, he says he doesn't want to make our customers happy, he wants to make them successful. And that really comes back to what you're trying to achieve and your objectives. So I think, I think that's, that's first and foremost. Um, I think uh, Kirshen touched on it earlier and also mentioned it as a key criteria to run ease of use. Um, it's got to be intuitive. Our platform is easy. It's, you know, the design of Cooper is really from the user being user-centric and from the user outwards in terms of everything that's designed within Cooper. Uh, because again, if you can't get that adoption, you're not going to drive that value. You're not going to drive that compliance and governance in your organization. And I think that's, that's, that's really critical from our perspective in terms of what the customer feedback is, you know, what a customer say about us um, and what makes us different. I think a couple of other things, uh, we, help, we are a comprehensive platform. Again, you can start small, you can scale, uh, but we cover everything from sourcing, contracts management, to P2P, risk management, and then even more recently into the supply chain space. So we acquired a company called uh, Lomasoft at the back end of last year. Um, and quite interestingly, we, we start starting to look at that unification between supply chain, demand planning and forecasting, and, and your, your spend management space, which which is quite quite unique in the industry today. And I think there's a lot of benefits going to come from that going forward. And I think one of the other, the other things is around what we call this community intelligence. So uh, Cooper is a cloud platform. Um, and uh, if you think about it, we have about 1,500 uh, customers globally, and we're starting to use that data uh, as big data analytics, uh, what we call in community intelligence. So bring in prescriptive analytics back to you in different forms, whether it's to help you with sourcing, make recommendations, identify missed savings opportunities, and also just share what, the, what, what similar companies and in industry are doing. So how, how is your category spend breakdown uh, aligned or similar to, to you know, the aggregated view of like, like uh, customers in your industry? And things like that, and we, we're growing that more and more to try and bring that the information that, that innovation back to you as, um, as our customers. And, and then last but not least, probably around the ease of implementation. So a big factor, what the SAD was talking about earlier, you know, he's got his hands full and trying to understand what that digital landscape is gonna look like. You're trying to identify best of breed solutions. How are they gonna to integrate together? How are they going to, to merge to provide you the best, uh, the best solutions and platforms going forward? And the last thing what the SAD wants is the spaghetti of of architecture and technologies and integration points all over the place. You want to try and simplify the architecture as much as possible with these new digital platforms going forward. And that's certainly one of the strengths of Cooper as well as around implementation and, and you know, ease from an integration perspective into multiple ELP systems. So I hope, I hope that answers the question. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I hope so. I hope to, uh, Tandeka, your question is addressed. Uh, and with that, you know, as we start to, you know, prepare for our wrap, off, uh, uh, wrap up. I wanna bring in Assad quickly uh, uh, for, for, for the next piece. Uh, and, and this is again, looking at the shopping list and you are uh, you know, the, the tech guy. Uh, you know, what, 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 what practical tips and tools are, are you recommending to, you know, or can you give the audience, for, for example, that want to go and look for, 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 for solutions, right? And what kind of, how, how do you make recommendations to your CFO on what's right and what's probably not appropriate? Yeah, thanks for the question, tough one. But I think, I think the most important thing for me is to take a step back. So what, I've, what I have experienced is that everyone rushes forth because they have a problem in a specific area, but no one really takes a step back to see what the bigger picture needs to look like and what the end game needs to be. Because if you go down the rabbit hole, you're only gonna end up solving one problem, if you get what I'm saying. You need to be a lot more holistic in terms of your approach. So I think taking a step back um, and creating a view of, of your world or the way you, you see your world in the next three years, in the next five years, et cetera, um, and truly ask yourself those types of questions. I mean, 
David mentioned, for example, you know, being on the cloud and, and the benefits that come with being on a cloud environment. Uh, but you have to ask yourself, do you want those disciplines as part of your organization? Or is this a discipline that you don't want to invest in? And you'd much rather, for example, just outsource it. So those are some key questions in a lot of different business areas that need to be answered. And they're hard questions. They're not easy ones. Um, that then I think would give you or help you shape what your roadmap is. Um, my second tip would be consider looking at a strategic partner, uh, specifically in the IT space. So, I mean, there's, there's many good guys out there. Um, some of them are specialized individuals, like as an example, uh, take the discipline of security or cyber security. There's, uh, it's a big concern for a lot of companies globally. Um, you need to obviously harden your position, et cetera. So I would, I would say you would need to do a little bit of research, but choose a partner. I think uh, it's very difficult for organizations and specifically business executives that are specialists in other areas um, to try and make key decisions uh, mm. from an IT mm. perspective. So my suggestion would be find a partner that you can work with, um, create your bigger picture view in terms of where you want to end up. Um, and then slowly start working your, your, your investment roadmap. I mean, if uh, procurement, as an example, is a burning point, then start with procurement. You know, you can prioritize it. But at least, you know, when you're making your decisions from a procurement perspective, you have a, you have a view of the, of the bigger picture. Um, and yeah, I, and I would leave it there at, at this point, Brian, considering, considering the time. Yeah, th thank you very much. And, 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 and with that, uh, I would like to obviously thank uh, the audience uh, for attending and for the great questions that you posted. Um, I also want to thank uh, specifically uh, Cooper for making uh, this happen, uh, David Hamilton and team. Uh, Kirshen Pillay, thank you very much. Your insights are always great uh, for this from Distal. Uh, Dumisani uh, Lavini as the CFO, as the tech CFO in residence uh, at this webinar. Thank you uh, very much. And of course, the insights uh, from Assad for keeping us honest uh, mm. on our tech uh, uh, on our tech journey. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. And um, as 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 I close off, I just wanted to remind everybody of uh, the financing diver that's coming up around the corner. Um, please sign up if you haven't signed up. Uh, there's a lot of uh, great topics that are going to come up uh, um, uh, there, and uh, please register. We'll like to see you all on on, on the uh, 31st of March. And you can come for all the uh, different workshops or just pick the ones that appeal to you the most. Uh, uh, with that, uh, from me and uh, the team at CFO, thank you very much and good afternoon to you all. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.